Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Henry Hitchings, whose first book was Dr. Johnson's Dictionary, a widely acclaimed portrait of both the man and the book. Henry stays with the subject of language for his new book, The Secret Life of Words, which tells the story of the development of our language through the fascinating stories of some of the tens of thousands of words which English has borrowed from other languages. And in doing that, it casts light on how we have seen ourselves and others throughout history. Early in the book, Henry writes about Anglo-Saxon words' remarkable power to earth us, providing our linguistic bedrock on which everything else rests. I asked him to tell me more. Of the hundred most commonly used words in English, I think something like 93 are words that are from that Anglo-Saxon rootstock. So they're the words of real antiquity. And a word like mother or heart or lots of words for sort of geographical formations as well, which have Anglo-Saxon roots, just feel like they've, they're sort of like they're palimpsests almost. They've, they've been, there are layers and layers of historical, not information exactly, but just, just historical exposure kind of imprinted upon them and embedded within them. I talk in the book about the study of language as a kind of archaeology of experience, which may sound a little bit pretentious, but it's this idea of um, Ralph Waldo Emerson's that words are, are fossil poems and that within every word there is, a, there is a story which is waiting to sort of almost to be unlocked or, or to be expanded or to be exposed. And then the other quote that I really like to set again or to set alongside the Emerson it's the one from the poet Don Patterson, who talks about words being like corpses, but corpses that are still alive. I think the quotation is something like, words are locked tombs in which the corpses still lie breathing. It's definitely that sense that you can reawaken all the poetry of a word by examining the kind of roots that it came into the language by, and also by thinking about the history of its usage, the flux in its meaning, and the people who've used it. Really early in the book, the word promiscuity comes up in the context of saying the borrowings from other languages have not been seen as a neutral act. And throughout the history of English, there have been charges that it, I think you give a quote, that it's a scum of languages because it simply skims off things from other languages. So I think all those things suggest that it's not not a, a debate without some moral charge to it. You know, it's not it's not a sort of simply a linguistic excavation that you're engaged in. I think that's right. I think all arguments about English usage are really moral and political arguments in disguise. So you've got a long tradition of purists who have been very resistant to imports from other languages, particularly hostile to imports from French and from Latin. Uh, they've always been saying, let's hark back to a kind of Anglo-Saxon culture. But very often in doing this, they've actually had a, a sort of crypto-fascist agenda. I mean, Percy Granger, the composer, is an interesting example of someone who did this. He talked a lot about what he called blue-eyed English. Uh, and he had all kinds of strange ideas about how we should return the language to a kind of older idiom. So instead of saying piano, which was a word imported from Italian, he wanted to call it a key hammer string which is really a bit of a mouthful, but really underlying all this was his own very sinister vision of, of racial purity and a kind of hostility to mixing miscegenation. And one of the things that I suppose I came across in, in researching this book, which I wasn't expecting to come across, was the very long history of resistance to foreign words. I think it's something that we're quite aware of now. We perhaps tend to say, oh, that's a terrible Americanism or something like that. But there have always been people who have been very, very eager to repel these new words. And the people who've, who've brought them have often been denigrated in quite moralistic terms. Shakespeare seems to kind of explode uh, in the late 16th century and introduces, is it 1700 new words into the English language, or at least the first attestation of them. Mm. It, is Shakespeare kind of unique in his, in his ability to coin and put into to circulation words in a way that no, no one before or since has been? Well, the period that Shakespeare was was writing in was a period of tremendous linguistic flux, that period at the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century. And the debates at that time were particularly fierce about words coming in, not just from French and Latin and Greek, but also from Italian and Spanish and some also from Dutch and even Portuguese. I think it is probably right to see Shakespeare as a, a sort of unique force, but it's quite easy to exaggerate that. And you, you touched on the idea that 
Very often Shakespeare provides our first attestation, but it may be incorrect to think of Shakespeare as the person who actually originates the use. It's that he was recording something which he had himself observed, perhaps in, you know, in, in sort of street talk, tavern talk, though we can't find it in any written text. So while I would definitely go along with the idea that Shakespeare is a sort of tremendous uh, linguistic force and and certainly the the source of many not just words but also idioms that have entered the language I do think it is possible to kind of deify him and exaggerate that a bit too much I suppose we shouldn't give the impression that all this assimilation of new words in English is, is simply a benign process of English people going out into the world and, and trading and bringing back new commodities. I mean, the the E word of empire is really important, isn't it? And the, the, the subjugation of peoples and expropriation of, of their resources is also part of the, the story that the language tells about the, the country's past. Oh, that's absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the, the, the sort of first two layers to impose themselves on the Anglo-Saxon word stock, the, the French from the Normans, and before that, the, the Norse words that come with the, uh, with the Vikings. Thereafter, the whole story is about English speakers going out into the world, almost always for financial gain, being kind of incredibly rapacious and picking up the names of commodities. So many of the borrowed words in English are nouns. And of course, what does a noun denote? It tends to denote a thing. And why does there have to be a noun borrowed for that thing? Because it's being brought home and it's being sold, so it has to be denoted. And I mean, one of the very obvious areas of this is is India, the kind of massive exploitation of the resources of India, which made Victorian Britain the, the so-called glory of the world, the, the most potent and the richest nation in the world. But it's it's yeah, it's a story of exploitation, and I think it's important to recognise that a lot of language bears the traces of of past traumas as well as of past pleasures and fantasies.